Hi, and welcome to episode five of the Unpacking Weight Science podcast called The Anatomy of a Weight Loss Paper. I'm your host, Fiona Willer, weight neutral professional development dietitian, academic and size acceptance advocate. Our learning goals for today are firstly, awareness of how to interrogate the methods section of a weight loss paper for non-weight related relevant information, and appreciate the research paper genre as one in which authors, editors and reviewers have creative influence over the findings narrative in the conducting of the research to start with and during the publishing process. So a research paper is a piece of persuasive writing. It wants you to believe that the topic studied is important and that the way they approached the topic was necessary and an effective way to look at the answers to the questions they'd posed. Weight loss research is conducted in many settings, but is usually part of a product trial, so funded by the producer of the product, and this can also include using PhD students to do the research, uh, and then the producer provides the product to the study free of charge and perhaps some other material support. So it's much easier, it's much cheaper this way, as a PhD student is both free labour and the company can claim that the research was conducted independently. So those studies happen a lot. Um, Weight loss studies are also pretty common masters um, and honours and PhD topics for students that are only funded by the universities. Um, The period where tangible results occur in a weight loss trial, that early period, so three to six months, is a nice neat time frame into which fits um, the student's candidature fits into. Before it's published, there are a few hurdles to jump. So the piece has to be written well and in academic ease. So this means that it has to use the correct terminology. And in the case of research about larger bodies, terms like overweight and obese are expected which is, you know, really thanks to medicalized weight centrism. So I've been, I have seen papers refer to BMI bands as acceptable and unacceptable, as well as the lower band being called normal or ideal. So clearly there's little scope for variation because of this um, norm within academic publishing. Um, the the only sort of variation that seems to be is that it, if it's consistent with the fat is bad perspective, it tends to get through. If you're trying to get a, public, a paper published, I encourage you to just use the BMI ranges instead of labels. So, um, for example, talking about pe- people with a BMI between 25 and 30. The article ha- also has to get past the editor and the reviewers uh, if it makes it past the editor in the first place. So all of those roles are carried out by actual human beings who usually have full-time jobs as well as having to do these uh, reviews um, and they're usually research academics in a field related to the topic because you know that's how peer review happens but those humans all have weight biases of their own and are also used to having a level of authoritative expertise so they're perhaps more likely to have these concrete ideas about human body weights it's harder to get weight neutral papers published to start with Okay, so I'm going to go through section by section now. So firstly, have a look at the authors and where they're from. As someone who's currently schlepping articles through the publication process for my PhD, I like to remember the human aspect of it, and I want to see if it's written by anyone I know of or from a university or research group that I'm familiar with. The supervising authors are usually down the end of the authors list as the primary authorship will rest with the leading researcher or PhD student. Whoever's doing the majority of the grunt work Um, will be listed as the primary author, or at least should be. Um, So uh, basically any names that might be familiar to to you are likely to be down the end of the list. So have a look at all of the authors in there. Next, look at the conflicts of interest that they may have declared. So these days we're told on pain of death to disclose ethical conflicts. For example, if we've accepted money from any corporation that may benefit financially from the findings outlined in the paper. So authors tend not to realise that profits from books that they've written about the same topic are also conflicts, so there's much missed out. It's tricky because people with expertise tend to write about things in books for money and be invited to talk at conferences and events for money and attract research funding in the field from industry who hope that their research can keep the gravy train going for them. None of this totally um, undermines the research findings, but it helps to see the perspective of the authors. 
So people do deserve to make a money, to make money and to eke out a living. I mean, I make money from the sales of my books and courses, but I'm also very clear about where my bias lays. I'm not pretending to be on the fence about being weight centric. <clears throat> weight loss researchers who present themselves as being objective and they absolutely believe that they are as well. So, you know, weight neutral stuff is seen as highly biased, whereas weight centric stuff, because it feels so normal, uh, is, you know, people will fight tooth and nail to try to defend that their position is neutral, when in fact, of course, it, it absolutely isn't. Um, people, uh, researchers particularly who present themselves that objective way are clearly not interested in recognizing that their own negative assumptions about weight have more in common with a belief system than rather than reality. So if there are any weight loss researchers or weight loss counselors listening, firstly, welcome. <laughs> uh, please, please, please remember to include that weight loss is not the only or necessarily the best option for people with weight concern who happen to be in larger bodies. Okay, so now next on to the introduction. The introduction will tell you what the researcher's frame of interest is, and it'll try to lead you into thinking that their research is of vital importance and different from all that has come before. If it's written well, you should be able just to skim read it by reading the topic sentences only. So that's the first sentence of each paragraph in the introduction section. The first paragraph will always be the obesity is now an epidemic and it's bad and we've got to stop it paragraph. The paragraph immediately prior to the methods section will summarise what they were looking for when they conducted the study. And some questions for you to ask then are what outcomes are they interested in? So there's a couple of different types of, of studies that related to weight loss. You've got, um, so most weight loss studies these days have a purpose. So is weight loss trying to decrease cardiovascular risk specifically or diabetes risk or decrease birth trauma? Like is there an actual out, health outcome that they're interested in or the other option is that it's a what they would like to call a novel way of losing weight and that means that the, what they're doing is sitting that finding on top of all of these um, assumed benefits of weight loss it's a sort of weight loss at any cost type of study and some studies will look at other things other than just weight loss which is great, actually. <laughs> um, but in terms of those other things, those other outcome measures, were those outcomes surrogate markers or actual endpoints is what you should be asking when you're reading these papers. So surrogate markers are themselves risk factors for disease, but aren't the actual hard endpoints themselves. Uh, for example, high cholesterol is not a disease. You can't feel that you have high cholesterol. It's pretty innocuous by itself. But people with high cholesterol have a higher risk of having a cardiovascular endpoint like a heart attack. And it's not a given necessarily that managing to push the surrogate marker back into the health reference range will actually impact on the likelihood of avoiding the proper disease or outcome. So a big study, long-term study that was conducted called the Look Ahead study showed that their weight loss and control groups were no different in terms of hard cardiovascular outcomes, so heart attacks and strokes after eight years of the weight loss group managing to maintain a weight loss of 8%. It was a really well-funded um, study. So they, dis they cho chose to discontinue the whole look ahead study at the nine year mark because they realized that there was no point in going ahead because their intervention group was having the same frequency of heart attacks and strokes as their uh, control group, which means it had no effect at all, but a whole heap of effort went into it. So um, if they don't have a specific disease reducing purpose, it will be that the weight loss itself, the method is novel and they'll be looking at weight loss as a primary goal, essentially asking, does this method work to elicit weight loss in a human? And these studies may include a qualitative part, trying to figure out whether the method was agreeable to the participants, but a lot of times they don't, which is interesting in itself. So they'll describe where and how they got their participants and what the inclusion and exclusion criteria were. Now look closely. Did they exclude old or sick people? Did they exclude thinner people? And this should make it difficult for them to be able to argue that it was the weight loss and not the behaviours that did the work, but that's hardly ever acknowledged. Thinner people who engage in health promoting behaviours also have improvements to their biochem um, associated with that behaviour change and temporary suppression of things like cholesterol related to the calorie deficit as well. Did they recruit from a general community? Have they got an intervention group and a control group to compare them with? 
That's a better option than them being their own control because when participants act as their own control, they won't have looked at what happens if the person makes lifestyle changes without trying to lose weight. They'll just use their first measurement as a baseline to compare their last measurement with. It's okay, but it's not as rigorous a study design. Remember that all people in weight loss studies are already what's called motivated volunteers. They've got the time and the inclination to participate in what usually means Uh, which usually means that they're higher socioeconomic status and generally healthier to start with. Even amongst people who live with chronic disease already, they tend to be the healthier ones that choose to participate in a uh, a weight loss study. So remember, we're not talking about um, studies of people who are already gravely ill and it's a treatment study. We're just talking about uh, weight loss um, studies. So they tend to be the healthier uh, motivated volunteers who volunteer for weight loss studies. So the group of people represented in that research study is not a random selection of people from a community like yours, and it's even less likely to predict what might happen to you at an individual level if you were to try that program. All research studies are really only relevant to a particular time, place and population. Making generalizations is pretty risky, and it's even riskier to try to predict what might happen to an individual. So look at the control group and see what they were actually doing compared with the intervention group. So it's never something compared with nothing for research conducted on free living humans. The sum of the activities of the intervention group minus the sum of activities for the control group is actually what's being tested. So even if you draw a table, look at how did the food differ between the control group and the intervention group? How did their activity levels differ and the type of activity? How did the attention from the research team differ? A weight loss study is actually a study of the sum of all the things that the participants were trying to do to lose weight, not a study of weight loss at all. Weight loss is like that dick at work that takes the credit for everybody else's efforts. Each of those things that the intervention group was doing differently from the control group may have a body of research on its independent effects in smaller people, or if you're lucky, on its independent effects in larger people. Bodies don't suddenly become completely biochemically and metabolically different at the thresholds between BMI 25 and BMI 30. Human bodies still function physiologically like human bodies, no matter what their weight is. So if there's been an intervention in smaller people to reduce high cholesterol, for example, that has been shown that, uh, for example, a higher intake of fruit and veggies is effective at reducing cholesterol levels, it is, by the way, uh, then we can be fairly certain that that effect still holds for a larger person. The energy restriction necessary for weight loss will suppress cholesterol a little bit more and only during periods of that insufficient energy intake. But that's what weight loss studies tend to grab a hold of and let weight loss take the entire credit for. This focus on weight loss being the key factor for health attainment or risk reduction completely vanishes the impact that lifestyle changes can have for people at any weight. Maddeningly, the argument made that is Uh, well, without scaring fat people into trying to lose weight, no one would take care of themselves at all. Um, Which my reply is usually, you've literally told everyone for years that weight loss is the primary important thing and now you're blaming them for thinking there's no point in doing anything except if it's for weight loss? That is a problem that weight centrism has created itself. Okay, so back to the study. Um... Was what was being asked of the intervention group reasonable, seem reasonable? For example, an intervention which includes two two two-hour sessions every week for six months is a lot of time out of somebody's regular life and not likely to be a reasonable ask or financially feasible if it's commercialised into a program for the public. Remember that the big commercial weight loss companies know that people won't pay more than 10 to 15 bucks per meeting in the long term, and they make their cash through volume customers and food sales these days. People will pay more for what they perceive to be a premium program, but that then excludes the demographic with the highest prevalence of higher body weight. So it's not a goer, even from a weight-centric point of view. There's also no way that a face-to-face program um, Face-to-face programs that are time and effort heavy and therefore would only be viable if run by university students and grad students, like free labour again, uh, could be able to impact on general population stats. Even if those programs did work in the long term, that just simply isn't the way to um, scale it up to a population level. So these kinds of papers are interesting, the ones that use a 
pretty intensive uh, intervention, they're interesting at an intellectual level, but they're actually really useless at a practical level. If it's more than one to one and a half hours a week um, and longer than about eight to 12 weeks, you can chuck that paper in the bin. Ask, how long was the study for? How long did the actual intervention go for? And how long were the participants followed after the intervention ceased? Many weight loss studies have an active intervention between three to six months in duration with a six to 12 month follow up. And remember our level A evidence statement. So weight loss is maximal at six to 12 months with weight regain for the majority by two to five years. So this phenomenon, initial weight loss followed by slower weight regain, means that the shorter weight loss studies capture that honeymoon period uh, and shorter follow up times miss the full extent of the weight regain. If the study has a graph of average BMI or average percentage weight loss over the study period, it will clearly show an addition, initial reduction in weight in the first three to six months with weight regain starting around the six to 12 month mark. The longer it's followed up, the further back the weight will be. Plus, you're looking at an average. Hidden behind that neat single line is a whole heap of people who have already gained more than that and a few people who've managed to maintain more of their weight loss. If it's a, boss, a box and whiskers plot or a box plot, uh, which is used if the data is quite skewed, it's not nice and even, then you'll see half of the participants represented inside the box uh, and the lines on either side indicate the range that the top and the bottom 25% of the results had. So it's pretty good if you've got a weight loss study that includes weight loss results um, as a box and whiskers plot at each time point, that's pretty great. You've got some good details there. Um, weight loss studies, you'll see if they do have that set up, that'll have quite narrow boxes at the six month mark when you've pretty much guaranteed that there will be significant weight loss and they get wider and wider as time goes by, uh, as uh, weight regain happens. Some people do keep the weight off, very few statistical outliers manage to, everyone else goes up and it just sort of spreads up over time. Um, so, so box plots fabulous for us weight neutral practi practitioners to see what's actually happening but uh, what is more frequently reported is just an average weight change as a single dot um, on a chart so uh, that with an average you will find standard deviations and using a standard deviation so most of the time when we read a study just the casual reader <laughs> we'll just um, ignore the numbers that usually sit in brackets beside uh, what's reported as the mean or average. But that number, the standard deviation, has a lot of information that we can use in there. So look for the standard deviation for each of those average points and see how wide the range was. So it takes three standard deviations to reach pretty much the end of the range. So uh, to give you an example, let's say the average weight loss uh, reported at one time point was 10 kilos with a standard deviation of five. So what that means is that 68% of the people had weight losses between five and 15 kilos at that time. So five above 10 and five below 10, one standard deviation each way. Uh, then when we move to st two standard deviations, it means that 95% of people fall within two standard deviations. So 95% of the people will have had weight losses between no kilograms <laughs> and 20. So 10 above 10 and 10 below 10. So two standard deviations each way. And almost 100% will have fallen between three uh, standard deviations. So that means between gaining 5 kilos and losing 25 kilos in this example. So we can use that mean, the average, and standard deviation to work backwards to see, uh, because when they use a mean, we know that the data will be what's called normally distributed or sort of um, symmetrical around that middle uh, mark, around the average mark. So we can work backwards to work out how many people uh, lost um, different amounts of weight. So let's say uh, the study group had 100 people in it. So that meant that two to three people lost heaps of weight. So between 20 and 25 kilos at that time point. And then about 12 of the people lost between 15 and 20 kilos. About 70 people of the participants lost between five and 15 kilos. You might call that sort of a typical result. About 12 
people lost between zero and five kilos and two to three people gained up to about five kilos. So, um, the, you know, the way that things are reported have got a fair bit of information in there for us. And, you know, this is a concept that we should be talking about with our colleagues and with our clients as well, because, you know, a typical result <laughs> does not necessarily mean that that's what most people, you know, if they do the program out in the real world are going to um, encounter as well. So talking about standard deviations from the mean is actually an important part of the informed consent process. Now, moving on. So let's talk about what long term and short term is regarded as. For some reason, a year is considered appropriate for the label long term in weight loss studies, which is utterly absurd. So anyone who has had anything to do with longitudinal observational studies over you know, decades just laughs and laughs at a year being called long term. So if the study had 12 month or less follow up, put that study straight in the bin as well. And look at the analysis method. Are they using a within subjects design? That's versus a between subjects design. They can only use a within subjects design if there's no control group. So if it's just the intervention group that they're following. Uh, and it means that they're looking at the changes in individuals over time separately and then compile, compile, uh, compiling an average from each time point. So note that any other outcomes are also averaged, which essentially means that if somebody doesn't lose weight but their cholesterol improves and the whole group does lose weight on average, that the, the person's cholesterol results will look like they were associated with weight loss when they weren't in that individual. Again, it's the weight loss that's taking the credit for these um, uh, behavioural changes. If they're using a between subjects design to compare the intervention group with the control group at each time point, you'll still get an averaging effect uh, of the within group analysis, controlled this time only for the behaviours and characteristics shared by the intervention and control group. So if randomization has been successful, which means that similar results would have been found had the control group been um, given the intervention and the intervention group being given uh, just set as the control group. That's ideal, but people who want to enroll in weight loss studies typically want to lose weight pronto and do not take kindly to having to wait around and not do anything different. Um, so there may or may not be a proper control group because if they go off and do things on the slide, which happens because people are independent beings, <laughs> you can't really blind a weight loss intervention group unless the control group is also following a tight meal plan, not just one that's calorie restricted. Um, and, uh, and if everyone's weighed without them being able to see, uh, and they're told that they're not allowed to weigh themselves outside of the um, study, and they're also ordered not to wear anything but stretchy material so that they can't tell whether their weight has changed. I mean, that's really the only way that you can blind a control group to whether they're in the weight loss um, or not. Look at the results section um, to see whether they can't conduct any post hoc analysis. So this means that un unplanned analysis done after the data is in. So things that they thought of later, <laughs> essentially. Um, they might have separated those who lost weight from those who didn't and compared the outcomes. And that would be interesting, but it's hardly ever done that way. Um, what's more common is that they'll run a regression analysis to see the relationships between weight loss and outcomes um, and that that stats test will work out, uh, for example, if uh, the average amount that of cholesterol that was lowered given a certain amount of weight loss, which then ignores the findings from people who didn't lose weight but still had improvements in their cholesterol because it's looking for that, that weight outcome. So... In summary, we've got two ways that health improvements for those who don't lose any weight are masked. Firstly, by jumbling up their outcomes into the average group outcomes and uh, selectively reporting only the outcomes experienced by those who did lose weight. So now to the results section. This is where a lot of the action happens. Look for how many stayed in the study versus how many dropped out. Weight loss studies are notorious for high dropout rates. Look for the term last measurement carried forward, which means that if somebody was uncontactable at the final time point, they just use the data from the last contact point and carried it forward to the end. Also, immediately throw that study away. It's meaningless and everyone involved has wasted their time. 
The most reliable analyses use intention to treat or ITT, which means that after recruitment, everyone stays in the data for analysis at the end and the missing data is treated as missing data, not vanished away as if it never existed. This makes it more difficult for a statistically significant result, of course, as it dilutes the effect that would have been found if those non-compliant people were spirited away. But if something is found using an intention to treat stats method, it's more likely to actually be a real thing. So uh, then the discussion part uh, compares the current study with those that have come before it. And due to the huge number of weight loss studies that have already been published, the papers that are cited in the discussions these days will or should be those which are most relevant to the things that this particular study was looking for. Um, so the introduction sets the scene, but the discussion contextualizes the current findings when compared with what's been done before. The end of the discussion will have a section or paragraph on the limitations of their research. Um, so that's their perceived limitations. It's always a weight centric uh, sort of perspective as well. If you find a weight loss study that includes implicit weight bias as a limitation, then go and reward yourself and please message me. I will start a hall of fame because I've never seen it yet. Um, moving on to the conclusion, that's where the authors can let their true colors shine. It's the least reliable section to read in order to get a good idea of what the research actually found. But unfortunately, it's the place that most people go to first to try to save time. It makes the assumption that the researchers are able to recognise the significance or insignificance of their own research, which is actually really unlikely. I mean, all researchers, including myself, we get this tunnel vision thing about the significance of what we're doing. <laughs> Um, and so we've quite sort of blinded when we're in the trenches. I mean, I've read mindful eating for weight loss studies where the authors have failed to realize or acknowledge completely that mindful eating might have any utility beyond weight management. I mean, it just blows my mind. So the conclusion section needs to be read with caution. <laughs> you need to avoid reading it until after you've, you've interrogated the methods and results section. It will only lead you down a false path. The conclusion also tells you what the researchers now wish they had looked at after becoming sick to the back teeth of having to deal with conducting and publishing the current study. So that's it for this episode. Uh, next time is the science of self-compassion, where I'll take you through the research and academic operationalization of self-compassion, uh, some of its associations and the effects on individuals in their self-care, as well as on health practitioners with compassion fatigue and burnout. I'll talk about how to weave language that models a self-compassionate attitude into your counselling and encounters with others and yourself. Uh, and the supplementary materials will contain exercises shown in experimental studies to induce self-compassion. So you get a bit back for yourself as well next time. So until then, goodbye. The supporting materials, which include the show notes, research links and self-test quiz are available up front for current subscribers, only five bucks a month, which is totally a bargain, uh, or can be purchased in a bundle if you're catching up later. You can see unpackingweightscience.com for details.